before we move on to the second design, let's uh, recall one of the drawbacks for the first one, which is about a violation of the cohesion design principle because we try to store the two unrelated attributes, premium rates and discount rates in the same class, students. So that's a drawback. And we will want to address this problem over here in the second design to see how much improvement we can make. Okay, so let's now go on to the second design. And apparently one, uh, one uh, obvious difference between the first one and the second one is in the second one, we are trying to split the student class into two classes in order to achieve cohesion. So premium rate will go into the resident students class and the non-premium rates attributes will go to the uh, non-resident students class. Apparently we are compromising uh, the number of classes uh, by splitting uh, one class into two, right? That's the uh, unavoidable sacrifice we have to make. Let's take a look at the resident students class first. So we're gonna class resident students and we got a uh, name and also an array of courses and also the number of courses. That one is really the same as the first one. And also we got premium rates only for the resident students is only applicable for this class. So we are really trying to achieve cohesion. And we got a constructor initializing the name and also number of courses just to be 10. And we got register, in which case we just uh, store the uh, course objects in the uh, relevant index. And we got get tuition. So this part here is only to calculate the base amount before we apply the premium rates. So you simply sum up all the fees in the course, right? And also we're gonna add up the tuition. Uh, we're gonna, once we add, added up the tuition for Every course, we're going to apply the premium rates that's applicable to the resident students class. Okay, so that's about the first class for the second design. Here's a question for you. How would the non-resident student class, uh, non-resident non student uh, class look like? Is it going to look uh, very similar to the uh, uh, resident student class or is it going to look very different? Well, the answer is it's going to look very similar. How similar? I think my highlights over here can already suggest to you the uh, the, uh, the only things that we got to change from resident students into non-resident students would be whatever I highlighted over here. We're going to change from resident students into non-resident students. We're going to change from premium rates into discount rates. And we're going to choose a constructed name for sure. And also we're going to choose that the base amount, the base tuition should be applied discount rate instead. All right, so that's, that means we got lots of du uh, duplicates of code, which will violate which design principle that we spoke about? Single choice design principle, right? If you forget about what it is, please review the earlier part in the first design. All right, so as I said, for the uh, now resident students class, the second class in the second design, we're gonna have still the same attributes we are repeating. And also we have discount rate rather than premium rates. And also we got a different name for the uh, constructor, obviously, because we are dealing with a different class. And also we got register method. You can see this also is a complete duplicate from the resident students class as well. And we got get tuition over here. And also we got uh, this part of the calculation is exactly the same for the base amount. However, it's only this part here uh, apply, uh, multiplied by the discount rate that's actually different from the resident student class. Okay. And let me just uh, put uh, both classes together. So we got lots of uh, rep uh, repetition, right? So what exactly uh, is the repetition? This part over here is exactly the same as this part over here between the two classes. And also this part over here is also the same, right? For the constructor. It's only the name of the constructor that's actually different. And also for the register method is completely duplicated between the two classes. So if you imagine that if we got different kinds of student, let's say resident students, non-resident students, and maybe international student, that means we got to duplicate the same amount of code again. And the calculation for the base amount is also duplicated over here, right? So you can see lots of duplicates. So that really violates the single choice principle. Okay, let me just uh, write it down. So lots of duplicates. That means violate, violating single choice principle. Meaning that if there's any change that we want to introduce, we will have to uh, deal with the change in the multiple duplicates ex uh, existing in different classes. We'll see example in a moment. Violating single choice principle. 
And again, we uh, talk about the definition for single choice principle in the first design. You can review that if necessary. Okay, let me highlight it once more since it's really important, single choice principle. Okay, and then let's now, before we just go on with any uh, more drawback for this design, let's now talk about how we can test, how we can use this class quickly. Let's also make the assumption that we got a course class with the title and the fee uh, for uh, the course class. And we got, uh, also we simply initialize the course by the title and the fee, right? Simple class. Let's say we got a student tester over here. Let's now go directly to the test just to see how we can visualize the uh, manipulation of the objects for the, uh, for the second design. For the first design, how to test it and how to visualize it, I'll leave that to you as an exercise. But it will be kind of similar to the, the second design. It's just that we got only one kind of student, only the student, uh, only a single student class rather than two different classes. I'll leave that as an exercise for you, okay? Let's now go over the visualization. So we are creating two courses over here, C1 and C2, over here. So we got 2030, we got 3311, 500 bucks for each one of them, let's say, okay? So we got, let's say C1, so that'll be EECS 2030. And that's uh, the tuition fee is fee simply 500. Similarly for C2, it's pointing to an object, the title should be EECS 3311 and also $500 for the tuition. Okay, and then let's now try to look at the two objects. So we got resident students, Jim. We are also going to create another non-resident students, Jeremy, just to show you these two critical lines. Okay, let's say for the first one. For Jim, uh, it's uh, actually here. Initially, uh, he, ha he hasn't registered for any courses, so that's why the number of courses will just be zero, but we still create the array according to the programming pattern. So the premium rates that we set the gym to is actually 1.25, 1.25. I'm not really uh, showing the uh, string attribute for the name over here, just for simplicity. And then we're going to register gym for the course. So uh, gym is going to register for C1 and also C2. So that means index zero is going to point to wherever C1 is pointing to, and also index one is going to point to wherever C2 is pointing to, right? That's something we actually have spoke, uh, have walked through very thoroughly in the earlier part, uh, in the earlier lecture, okay? Okay, let's see the, uh, the next one. What about Jeremy? Okay, use a different color. So let's say for Jeremy, uh, we're going to set its uh, discount rate to be 0 0.75, right? Oh, by the way, we assume that for premium rates, the private attributes, we got the corresponding mutator set premium rates. And for discount rate attributes, we also assume we got the corresponding mutator set discount rate. That's something we assume. So let's say we set the uh, discount rate to be 0 0.75 over here. And then we're gonna register Jeremy to be C1 uh, to uh, in, into the courses for C1 and C2. So Jim and Jeremy, they're simply just classmates, okay? So index zero, pointing to wherever C1 is pointing to, and also index one pointing to wherever C2 is pointing to, right? Easy uh, visualization. And now, how do we actually uh, see the working uh, for the uh, tuition calculation? Let's see this. We say, uh, Jim dot, uh, let me just use a better color here. How about orange? Jim dot get tuition, and also Jeremy dot get tuition. You can see we are really calling the same get tuition method over here, but the context object is actually different. One is actually Jim, the other one is Jeremy, right? So that means the calculation will be different. Let's see exactly how they will how how they, how they will be different. For the first one, Jim dot get tuition, we are really calling this version over here. So that means we're gonna add up the fee uh, for this uh, for this part over here. So that'd be five hundred plus five hundred. 1,000, and then apply the premium rates. So that'll be 1,000 over here, the tuition multiplied by, the premium rate for gym is 1.25. So that'll be the calculation, you can do the math, okay? What about Jeremy? And for Jeremy, you can see here, we the context objects also get tuition, but it's going to call this version of get tuition uh, as uh, instead. But this part here for the base amount calculation will be the same. So we just go over these two courses in the array 
that'll be 500 plus 500 again. So that'll be 1,000 for the base amount. Multiply by, what's the uh, discount rates for Jeremy, the non-resident student? 0 0.75, right? If you do the math, you can definitely see these two numbers are simply different, meaning that even though their classmates register for the same list of courses, but they still pay differently because they are different kinds of students. Okay, that's just the nature of the uh, uh, example setup. All right, so everything definitely works, okay? Let me go back to the slides, right? You can also go over the code, which I just illustrated. So implementations for both student classes seem to work, but can you see any potential problems with it? Actually, that's the problem I just mentioned to you. Let's talk about the two drawbacks for the first design. Does the second design satisfy cohesion? The answer is it does. It does satisfy cohesion. Let me just uh, make a note over here. So especially I want to point out exactly how it actually satisfy cohesion. You can see the premium rates and also discount rate over here because these two attributes are set uh, s split into do, uh, two different classes. So they are not really mixed together into a single one like in the first design. So that means cohesion is actually check. Okay, so co cohesion is actually satisfied. Cohesion is actually satisfied. All right. So what about single choice principle? Right? That's something I already spoke about. That's already answered. But I still gave you the hints over here. Maintenance of code. Think about if you want to uh, uh, add something or delete something from the, uh, uh, maybe for the policy change. In that case, you may have to modify multiple places uh, in your classes. In that case, that's violating single choice principle. Let's see. So the, uh, the code of the two student classes share a lot in common. You can see whatever I highlighted in green over here. So they are all duplicated between the two classes, right? If you actually got more kinds of student, let's say international resident student, in that case, you just, you, you're simply creating another class alongside and you're gonna repeat all the code into over here as well, right? That's definitely not the way to go for the second design. That's the main drawback. Okay, duplicates of code make it hard to maintain your software. That's really the critical takeaway for this uh, second design. This means that when uh, when there is a change on the policy, for example, on the common part, we need to modify more than one places. It violates the so-called single choice design principle. But we already defined what a single choice design point, uh, design principle is in the first design. Okay. Okay. Let's now just uh, give you some uh, ideas over here. Let me give you two examples. Okay. Let's see how the uh, single choice design principle can be violated. The first one. Let's say the maintenance The maintenance we want to do is, let's say we have a new registration constraint. Let's say every time you want to register, you want to make sure the number of courses like NOC counter, if it, uh, if it is larger than or equal to some maximum allowance, you're going to throw some too many courses exception. Otherwise, you can register for the course. Currently, we don't have that conditional behavior right now. So, uh, currently, we just simply allow the student to register for as many as they like, up to 10. But let's say the maximum allowance may be set to maybe five, right? That's more realistic. Let's say we want to apply this new policy to every kind of student, resident kind and non-resident uh, kind. How many changes do we have to make? If it's actually more than one changes, then you're violating single choice principle. The answer is we have to, we have to modify this method over here. And also we have to modify, oh, let me just draw again. We have to modify this method over here we also have to modify this method over here, right? So this one here, we're gonna say, if the number of courses is larger than or equal to some maximum, in that case, we're gonna do something over here, right? Similarly, here, we gotta, re uh, we gotta repeat the same change. We're gonna say, if the number of courses is larger than or equal to some maximum over here, the same block of code, and then we're gonna do some uh, actions accordingly. So more than one places. It definitely violates the single choice principle because more than one. Okay, let's now go on to the second example, which is similar. Let's say we want to make another change, which is about the tuition formula. We may have to also in account for maybe inflation rate. That's maybe from the school point of view. They may they just have to charge you higher this year, uh, year after year, just because because of the inflation. In that case, what should we do? Well. Is there only a single place that we have to apply for the inflation rate or multiple places? The answer is, it's gonna be multiple places. It's gonna be over here for the resident students and also over here 
for the non-resident students, both places actually. So here we're gonna say multiply by inflation rate. And also here we're gonna say multiply by inflation rate. So there'll be multiple places for the changes. In that case, it's gonna violate single choice principle. All right. Okay, let's now go back to the slides. Hopefully that's clear to you. All right, that's exactly what I just illustrated about the two possible changes. You can definitely go over it again. All right, finally, let's now uh, concern a little bit about how to define the student management uh, system class, okay? How can we define a class student management system that contains a list of residents and non-resident students? So the idea is we want to have a mix, uh, like a mixed select, uh, mixed collection of resident and non-resident student. They're simply random, randomly stored into the system, like a re in reality. How do we do that? So far, what you have learned is every member in the uh, in a single array must be of the same type. But given that the resident student class and the non-resident students class, given that they're two different classes, you just cannot store them into a single array. You just cannot, okay? So what we gotta do instead is to declare one array of type resident students. We got another array of non-resident students class. You might be thinking about why don't we simply declare the type here to be objects? But you might, you, might, you might be thinking uh, in another direction, I can tell you that it's not what we are talking about. Because if you simply put objects over here, it is true, you can actually store anything inside the array, only a single array. However, you're gonna suffer from lots of casting uh, instance of checks. So I wouldn't go that way. But I, I might discuss that maybe later towards the very end of the inheritance lecture. But for now, the only way that we can do uh, in a slightly more convenient way is to declare one array for resident students only and the other one for non-resident students only. It immediately kind of violates the reality. In reality, all the students are going to be mixed into a single collection rather than gonna say you're gonna separate them between two collections. Anyway, let's see what's really worse. Given that we got two different arrays, that's gonna that uh, they are going to work independently. That means we need two integer counters, one for resident students and not another one for non-resident students. Okay, we are instantiating the programming pattern twice, and we want we might just need one mutator method for adding resident students. Right in that case, we just uh, store that resident student into the relevant index, and we might just have another mutator method for adding non-resident students into the corresponding array uh, index. So far, it's very straightforward, just that everything you have to do for one array, you gotta duplicate it for twice, right? Again, duplication means we violate the single choice principle. Let's say we have one method over here, we wanna register a single course, maybe a common course for every student in the system. Maybe, maybe there's common, uh, common first year course that every student must take. So that's why they are registered to that course automatically. In that case, how many loops do we have to write? in order to register for every student in here and also here. Well, apparently we got only, we got two arrays in this example here. So that means we wanna write two loops, one loop for adding all the students in this array to register into this course. And another loop for registering all the students in this array, in the second, uh, this second array into that course. But what if we got 10 kinds of students? If we got 10 kinds of students, number one, we will get 10 different arrays to store. Number two, we will get 10 different mutators to actually support for each kind of students. And also we got 10 different kinds of, uh, 10 different counters to really support the pattern. And inside the register all, we need 10 different loops to actually uh, uh, register the courses, uh, to register the course for every student in that particular array. It's so inconvenient, especially if you think about your, your uh, software maintenance in the long term. Okay, so that'll be the first loop over here. We just uh, go over the first array uh, from uh, from the beginning until the uh, counter end, and then register every student for, for that course. And we need a second loop as well, right? So as I said, you wanna think more about your software in perspective. What if you have many kinds of students in the student management system? In that case, you, you, would, you would just need, simply need so many arrays to store all the student objects. That's really the main drawback, okay? That's exactly what I just said, right? Okay, hopefully you, 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 uh, you see that point. Very inconvenient to handle the list of students separately. Wouldn't that be nice if we can do the following, right? Let me just go a little bit further to visualize it. You can see here, uh, we got resident students array 
we got non-resident students away and at the runtime it might be that we got so many students in the resident students array and we got so many students in the non-resident students array in that case whenever you want to let's say register for all the students into a single course first of all you have to go over every student in this array first by one loop you gotta go a second loop to go over every student in this particular second array and then do the registration it's not just not convenient okay all right so that's about uh why uh this student management system is not so ideal it would be very nice let me just write down what what might be ideal ideally ideally if we can only declare a student's array only a single one to store both kinds of students So here your your response to me might be oh why don't we use design number one if we use design number one then we can store only we can definitely just store a single array for students just it's just that for every student we have to use the kind uh encoding integer encoding but that was actually violates both cohesion and also single choice principle that's not something we want to compromise okay while satisfying cohesion and single choice principle so the, so here we are really defining the criteria for uh, an ideal design criteria what number one a single array to store both kinds of students ideal num uh, criteria number two we want to satisfy cohesion a criteria number three we want to satisfy single choice principle is there such a design indeed so the answer is inheritance which is the third design that we're going to talk about the reason that i want to really introduce to you the two alternative designs without using inheritance is to show to you without the support of uh, some object orientation in a language like java that's what you have to do but you have to know what the drawbacks are but in the case where you got some uh, object orient uh, orientation feature supported like Java you definitely want to go for the inheritance solution which will actually satisfy all the three criteria I just laid out all right so hopefully you're okay so far okay so that's about what I want to uh, go over for the second design and there is one hyperlink over here a polymorphic collection of students this is what we will eventually get into uh, when we talk about inheritance you can uh, just remember once you actually have studied all the inheritance lecture and for future review always remember to contrast this design over here where we got so many arrays of the student kinds you can actually have only a single array by using the so-called polymorphic collection which we'll get into later